Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the November 8, 2022 regular meeting of the Everett Public School Board of Directors to order. I'd like to take a few minutes for a moment of silence for one of our neighborhood communities, the community of Ingram High School in Seattle, in which a student died today because of gun violence. I like to say, and it's too bad that we have to say this very often, but we mourn and we grieve for our student families, our students' friends, and our community around which they live, and our schools as well. So please, with me, let's just reflect. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I will now present the land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land on whose shoulders we stand. In Everett Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belongings for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Lusane. Present. Vice President Mitchell. Director Nichols. Present. Director Mason. Present. Director Herman. Present. Student Representative Colley. Present. Student Representative Gilbertson. Present. Thank you. Our first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Salzman, would you introduce tonight's agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public this evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following. The superintendent's report, a segment for board comments, a segment for public comments, a segment for routine business, a segment for information and discussion, a segment for new business, a segment for upcoming agenda items, and an executive session. Since publishing the agenda, the following changes were made to the agenda. Item 7.01, the superintendent's report, the presentation was added. Item 10.02, approval of the personal, personnel report, updates were made to the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. Is there a motion for the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Director Nichols and seconded by Director Mason to adopt the agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The motion carries. The agenda is adopted. We'll now move to section 6.0, which is recognition. And tonight we have a National Merit Scholar semifinalist recognition. I see we have the present. The well, announcer. I'm not presenting, I'm announcing the presenter. So okay. thank you for having me here tonight. Um, we do want to uh, bring up uh, Principal Bala from Jackson High School so he can introduce his outstanding students. Thank you very much. Uh, should I have the students come up or stand up when I read their names or 
Will we acknowledge them after I read? Why don't you bring them up? Come on up, Jasmine and Abby. <laughs> I didn't know if they were going to make you stand up front, but there you go. <laughs> All right, I'm delighted tonight to present two outstanding students from Jackson High School who are both, as has been mentioned, National Merit semifinalists. Um, want to speak first about Jasmine? Jump along. Jasmine is motivated to excel as a student by her love for learning, as well as her desire to do her very best on every task she sets her mind to. During her time at Jackson, she has taken 13 AP courses, including four this year. She's most proud of being able to maintain a 4.0 GPA through her junior year, while juggling both her in-school and out-of-school responsibilities. Next year, she plans to start college and pursue a biology-related major and wants eventually to attend graduate school, possibly earn a PhD, and become a research scientist. So our congratulations to Jasmine Jumpwalk. I'm also delighted to present Abi Basak. His biggest motivation is to be able to make a change in the world. By focusing on his learning, he plans to work towards becoming a mechanical engineer and thus work towards his end goal of creating new innovative solutions to any problem. His most proud accomplishment is his, in his high school life so far has been playing on Einstein at the Robotics World Championship in Houston, where we represented for sure. During high school, he has taken 11 AP classes, including five his senior year. No senior vacation for him. He intends to pursue a master's in either mechanical engineering or biomedical engineering and hopes to increase access to medical aid in underserved communities by creating machines and medicines that can more effectively treat people in extreme environments. Congratulations to Avi Basad. Oh, he wants to just stand behind. You can stand behind too, that's great. Let's move everybody over this way. So you guys can come here. How about right here? I'll come down with the captain. Wonderful. On behalf of the board, I'd like to present this recognition to both of you. Oh, yeah. Are your parents here? Would you like the parents to come up? I know that what's out there. Brothers, too. Brothers, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's because I don't know. Okay, everybody's got to squeeze in. Squeeze in a little bit. And oh my gosh, I can. Ready? Oh, One, two, three. We're going to take a couple here. All right. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm on that letter, Abby. <laughs> And I do want to say congratulations again. And I do, um, I love the field of biology. At my first, my, my first focus was biochemistry and mechanical engineering. That's what I got my, that's a good field to go into. <laughs> so good luck to you all and congratulations. We'll now move to section 7.0, which is the report by the superintendent. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public. And again, uh, my heart goes out to our Seattle Public Schools uh, families and colleagues tonight. And uh, we pray for everybody at this time. This is Native American and Alaskan Native Heritage Month. want to let our public and our board and our public know 
that we are now participating in a district in the Guaranteed Admissions Program, or known as GAP. GAP allows every public school's juniors and seniors who meet three requirements to be guaranteed admission to five outstanding participating institutions, Central Washington University, Eastern Washington University, Evergreen State College, Washington State University, and Western Washington University. To qualify for the Guaranteed Admissions Program, a student must have cumulative GPA of 3.0, complete the necessary college academic distribution requirements, courses in high school, complete the Guaranteed Admissions Program opt-in form, given parental permission to release information to participate in colleges and university. What an amazing opportunity for these students and what a great partnership. Thank you. I would like to congratulate our amazing board for being named a board distinction from WASDA. Well, well deserved. They were honored for presenting exemplary evidence of ongoing professional development, addressing opportunity gaps, and, pra and practicing governance that reflects the Washington School Board standards during the 2021-2022 school year. Thank you for your visionary leadership in one of the most hardest times in public education. Board well deserved. <laughs> and lastly, a reminder that everyone, there is still time to get your ballot in and exercise your right to vote. It is 5.15, you have till 8 p.m. So to our public, get your vote, it counts. I wanna thank everybody for your attention this evening and truly appreciate everybody's work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. We'll now move to section 9.01, which is our public comments. Nope, excuse me, we'll back up to board comments, section 8.0. The purpose of board comments is to share what the directors and representatives have encountered through their work in the school district. So we will get started with that. Who, who would like to start? Director Nichols, let's start at this end and let's go down the road. Uh, I don't have anything to report at this time. I do hope that everybody is got their power back on and safe and dry and warm. And um, please get your ballots in tonight if you haven't already. Director Mason. I too don't have much to report. Um, I did have an opportunity after our last meeting to uh, uh, stop by the Everett High School, High School and Beyond event, which was their first um, during the day event. Um, it was really great to see all the students there, see all the, once again, um, the people that turn out, the colleges, um, Everett Fire, Everett Police, a lot of community organizations there. and. Um, it is just truly something wonderful to eavesdrop on these conversations between the um, students and these individuals that are essentially recruiting them to come their way to either participate in their program, their school, their training. Um, so that was just a great event. And um, our foundation gave out the coolest bags with these big yellow E's on them. <laughs> so very, um, to each student that um, attended. So I thought that was super cool. You know, they could tuck all their their papers and such in there. Um, and then was able to race off to the instructional review at Madison, which um, it's fun to be a part of a school for many years and, and see the changes and the progress and the growth. Um, and I had an opportunity to do that. I don't know, this was my fifth or sixth um, review at Madison Elementary. Um, and it was, as many of them are, a very good one. So that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Herman, would you like to make a comment? Um, yes, I want to send a big thank you to Ann Arnold and her team in our early learning programs. Last Thursday, I was able to go and um, visit the Play and Learn session, which was held at Sequoia and this in the gym and this is the free drop-in program for children up to age five and their caregivers and the locations rotate around our district and it was um, including uh, Mill Creek City Hall and then Everett Public Library so um, I look forward to seeing some of those other locations as well uh, second second week 
of every month, they do the circle time and dual language, which I also think is just such a neat opportunity for families. Um, and so I saw moms, dads, grandparents with their children, variety of learning stations, just with uh, gross and fine motor skills activities and uh, the reading time. It's just a wonderful program to see in action. So if you haven't had a chance to go and visit that, um, I would just highly recommend it. A lot of times we think of those early childhood years as just simply play for children versus that high quality um, early learning environment. And of course, we know that those first five years just have um, long term impacts on social, emotion, emotional, cognitive, and physical development. And so, again, a big thank you to our early learning team focusing on our youngest learners, helping them build that strong foundation before they even enter kindergarten um, and making, making that all happen for everyone. Just a free drop in program. So, it was wonderful to see. Thank you very much. Move on to student rep calling. Hi. Um, so there hasn't been much going on around school. Um, we just ended our football season, and now we're starting basketball season. Everyone's getting pretty excited for that. Um, we had Fun Fest a couple weeks ago. We had a very big turnout. It was a lot of students that came. And um, we had different booths from different clubs and sports showing what we have around school, just like fun games for people to play and they could bring their siblings. So that was fun. And um, I'd also like to apologize to all the students in the, Everett, the Seattle Public School District because of what happened today. Um, it's not fair that people have to go to school worried. And I'm really just sorry that all of that had to happen. And I know people who even go to that school and it was a really scary experience for them. So I'm really sorry that that had to happen. Um, and also for the guaranteed admissions program that you were talking about, um, that program has been helping us a lot, specifically the seniors, especially in my AVID class, um, that guaranteed there's a lot of students who have like just 3.0 GPAs and they've been nervous about getting into colleges. So it's helped a lot of people to have that program. And so thank you for that. Also, it is election day. So I please go vote. I cannot vote, but my civics teacher, <laughs> would be very, very happy if you went and voted. So <laughs> go vote. Thank you. Student Rep Gilbertson. Hi. Um, it kind of, it was disappointing yesterday that you didn't get a school day. I know you're hearing that from a student, no school, and I was disappointed. Um, but yeah, uh, the school ground's still a bit messy from the whole windstorm stuff. Hopefully that gets cleaned up soon. Um, and I'd like to mention uh, that, yeah, the high school and beyond that happened in the gym was amazing. I got to learn about some trade schools and some of the colleges that I've um, been looking at and wanting to go to. So, yeah. Thank you very much, student Rep. Gilberson. I, again, would like to make a comment to congratulate our National Merit Scholars. I'm looking for uh, next year when we have a lot more. National Merit Scholars from Everett uh, that we can recognize and say congratulations to them. Also, uh, yes, it is Native American and uh, Native Alaskan Heritage Month. That's We need to do this more than just one time a month. This is American history, which should be throughout the entire year. So I am a proponent for that. But I do love to recognize our, our Native Americans and our Native Alaskans. That is wonderful. I also found out today, being a proponent of music and arts, that today is also National Pianist Day. I did not know that before, but I found that out. So as we um, ensure that our students have received art as well as music, and we have orchestras and bands throughout the fine arts here, you know, it's just a wonder that we can continue to give our kids that education and that true breadth of experience of music. So, thank you. We'll now move to section 9.0, which is public comments. Dr. Salzman, do we have any public comments for this evening? I do no. not know of any at this time. Thank you very much. We'll now move to our next section, which is section 
which is our consent agenda. Dr. Salfman, would you provide an introduction for the consent agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board Directors and the public. The Board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items, such as meeting minutes, personnel actions, expense vouchers, surplus lists, gifts, grants, and recurring contracts. Sometimes it includes items that occur less frequently, but are of a routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the Friday report, one or more weeks before the board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider a discussion about the policy implications of these items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, the consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received and answered one question regarding the surplus technology and electronic equipment. The consent agenda is presented as published for board approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salsman. A motion to adopt the consent agenda is now in order. So moved. It's been moved by Director Herman and seconded by Director Nichols. To approve, does any director wish to remove an item from the consent agenda, place it under new business section of the agenda? Hearing no requests, we'll now proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The motion carries. The consent agenda is approved. President Lassane, may I have a, a moment? Yeah. I just wanted to go back regarding those comments because also my Instagram told, account told me earlier today that it is National STEM Day. Oh. Um, and <clears throat> I just want to point out, since I've been on the board, the amount of STEM education that we have infused into our schools over the last many years. And the fact that every single one of our schools now has a robotics team, um, we now offer STEM career pathways. Um, we have done so much work around this. Um, it, it started, my phone just told, Google told me it started in 2015 and um, we have come a long way since then. So I just, I'm very proud of that work. Just wanted to point that out. We are very proud of that work. Thank you so very much. Thank you for bringing that up. Does anybody have any other national days today? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of those these days. <laughs> Okay, we'll now move to section 11.0, which is strategic progress monitoring. There are no strategic progress monitoring reports scheduled for this evening. We'll move to section 12.0, which is information and discussion. Right now, we do have a technology spotlight presentation by Brian Beckley, and he is at the podium. Take it away. Good evening, President Hussein and Board of Directors and Dr. Saltzman and the community. I am presenting to you tonight the spotlight presentation on technology. Specifically, it is around the integrated technology plan, the six-year integrated technology plan and the updates around that from the 2016 plan. This is a high-level, broad overview of the, of the goal areas and um, and appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. Before I get started, I, I do wanna kind of point out this picture because I think this picture really is a snapshot of the transition we've made from 2016's plan to the current plan. And in this, and in this picture, you see students, multiple students really engaging with the technology and the learning opportunities that the teacher has provided. Not possible without the technology to be able to do this. In the foreground of the picture is the technology that it's replacing. It's that static projector and those external speakers that are not even, you know, they're not on, can't, students can't engage in it. And I think really is a snapshot of the transition this district has made over these last several years from the first to the second iteration. I think really tells the story in one snapshot. Is this a planned? Evolutional picture that it, you have. It isn't. Here? It was. It just happened that way. No. But 
All of this would not be possible without our voters, and I, I can't uh, get started without thanking our voters and our community for investing in our kids and our staff and the renewal of the capital levies earlier this year. Uh, so appreciate the vote of confidence our, our community's uh, given in us and uh, provided our students the opportunity. The integrated technology plan is really the plan about how we bring to life the, the, the dollars that the communities invested, our plan to realize the full potential uh, that innovative technology tools can have for our staff and our students. It's really the, the, the plan behind uh, being able to implement the levy. So thank you very much to our voters and our community. In tonight's uh, overview, I'm gonna spend a, a brief amount of time kind of talking about the background and the update process of the integrated tech plan and highlight some, some key aspects of the six goal areas with a look ahead to some kind of initial steps with an opportunity for questions at the end. Really, the integrated technology plan is grounded in the district strategic plan under the umbrella of the district strategic plan and the strategies and the action items that are in the integrated tech plan are woven into the strategic plan. So you see in the tech plan that there's strategies, there's key measures, and then each is really, uh, it's called out about its alignment to make sure each of those action items are directly linked to the district strategic plan. The six goal areas, uh, the, the process we went through of updating the plan, I, I wanna highlight, it really was a continuation of looking at the National Office of Education's technology plan. And the five of those goals are built into that plan, the leadership, teaching, learning, assessment, and infrastructure. But just as we did in 2016, we thought it was important that connection to our community, that outreach and that feedback loop with our community to continue that goal area of outreach. And the, all of last year, the Technology Advisory Council, that's, we have parents, we have community members, we have business owners, we have uh, district staff on there. Um, we, we had some students last year that were involved in the, the TAC plan as well. Uh, the update we spent all of last year looking at all the strategies and looking at the different aspects of what uh, could be strengthened uh, what uh, were the important aspects of the plan to pull those into this year's plan overall really if i was to think of a theme from the 2016 to the 22 plan is going deeper into moving from having the things to its full use of those items moving beyond practice of of having it to practice of using it authentically in the classroom. And that was important in the professional learning around uh, being able to provide that. In the first goal area of leadership, it's the role of the leader. What's called out in this is a leader's ability to, to assess what their needs are and where they're at. And for our, and, and whatever their role is, whether it's teaching, whether it's learning, whether it's operations, and assess what their, their ability to lead that work and what they need from, in, from my department, the technology department, to be able to support that. And that's various ways. You, you know, we see that in our IR uh, learning walks um, with instructional reviews. We see that uh, in school improvement plans and department action plans. And there's uh, many examples of our departments uh, with our academics uh, teams, special education, CTE, maintenance, human resources. These are just some that come to mind where leaders are partnering with us about how we can support them and their ability to lead this work uh, with their teams. Uh, many examples of, of that taking place. And I highlight here the digital tool, tools portal because are, are really wanting the leaders to look at what's an improved tool that we already have in the district. How can that be utilized to meet their needs? And we're using those uh, authentically. And if there's not something there, looking at an ability to add that to the, to the, to the mix for them to be able to have access to. So all that's woven into this, to this plan. The teaching goal area, the, the really the main focus is the, the SAMR learning model. And that was really called out by the Technology Advisory Council to emphasize the ability to model and train staff in technology and the professional development and the collaboration to empower staff to know how to do that. So you see some of our members of our LITS team, our, our facilitators and our LMS directors, the ability to move from enhancement to transformation, to move from simple substitution of something that's technology that's just substituting for something that wasn't, to rethinking about and reimagining what the classroom 
uh, or the operational uh, task is that's possible. And we want our students to be able to examine problems, to think deeply and to experiment and want them to have information at their fingertips. And that's all built into this goal area of the learning experience for our students and, and my department's ability to support uh, them and being able to do that. For the learning, uh, the goal area is for them to be able, as students, to be able to learn how, as a, the, the citizenship around safe practices online, around what it means to be a good citizen digitally and making sure they're doing it safely. That was a key uh, pullout in this, uh, in this goal area. Uh, and as well as utilizing the ability for technology in the design of their learning experiences to really have that more of that project-based learning that's keyed on their personal interests, almost a choose your own adventure type uh, thing and that technology can really support that aspect. Uh, and you see some examples here. Uh, on the far right is the, our librarians who spent so the summer working on the elementary digital citizenship and now they're focused on those units for, for secondary. For the assessment goal area, there is the ability to leverage technology for technology-enabled assessments. And I give two examples here, Performance Matters and iReady, um, and, and the professional development around, around those, not only in their use of them, but the ability to um, machine score them. And our academics department are in the process of revising all of the end of unit assessments so they can be administered in performance matters. And then the use of technology and the machine scoring, scoring of most of those items make it possible for administrators and teachers to be using their time and resources to really gear it to best meet and inform their instructional and their interventions they, they have with students. Some really, really powerful tools all of which is possible and key about that life cycle management, making sure that we keep updated the tools that are available so these assessments can be ready and the scoring can, can occur so they can best meet their, their needs. So life cycle management is called out in this uh, because it's important that we keep updated on our tools to be able to do this. For the outreach goal, the the stakeholders, which include our families and our strategic partners, are, are, key, are key to this. And our Technology Advisory Council, which I mentioned, uh, is our great partners. And, but we have other opportunities to engage in that feedback loop with our Let's Connect events, for example, our Let's Talk tool to be able to hear parent feedback. But what's in this goal that, that was important that we include is to strengthen those feedback loops for outreach with our families, for more two-way communication, for having things on site, whether it be in Zoom or in person at the various sites, to be able to not just rely on providing information, but engaging with our parents uh, about how the best they can support their students at home. Um, so maintaining the pieces that we have but strengthening it for outreach was, was an important aspect of this. All of this would not be possible without a solid infrastructure. So that being the sixth goal area, making sure we maintain what we have uh, infrastructure. Our staff and our students and our families have to be able to rely that they're going to have things that work, that can connect reliably and safely. We're going to keep their information safe and, and uh, there, we have to continue to build out more and more is going to happen wirelessly. We need to continue to strengthen our wireless network to be able to support that in the classroom. So in a, a look ahead, just really three key buckets here as we start off the 22 plan is deepening our use of technology beyond initial use for our staff and our students. That connection to the strategic plan around inspiring, achieving, and thriving are key aspects of the integrated tech plan right from the get-go, and especially in those teaching, learning, and assessment goal areas. Also working, and this is in the strategic plan as well, called out uh, a guaranteed uh, classroom technology standard, so there's equity in no matter what classroom or no matter what school, it's the same classroom kit. And that is uh, something we're working on currently right away in the, in the integrated tech plan. And ultimately, we want our community and our students and our staff to be able to know that their information is, remains private and that it's secure. And we are constantly looking to update those. That will almost be like a yearly goal area because we need to make sure we're, we're up to date on that. And that includes training for our staff and our students 
on what that means to, to have safe practices uh, online. And I would be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Directors, any questions? Director Thank you for the presentation and, and the uh, integrated uh, plan that came along with it. I was thinking back to spring of 2020 and devices and um, where we were. Are we comfortable now in saying that all of our students and families not only have devices but are able to have reliable internet? Um, that is now sort of our standard. It's making sure that our families have internet at home that yeah. don't have internet, right? Yeah. And that's Little that's built spots. that's built into the plan as well. Yeah. Providing hotspots is something okay. we're we're currently doing through through capital levy through the through the ability of using capital levy dollars. Okay. Um, so yes, if, if there are students that don't have reliable internet at home, you use that word and that's right. an, an important one. Uh, we've either connected them with broadband service with Comcast, for example, or T-Mobile. Most okay. of them opt for the hotspots okay. and we provide those. Okay, so that's now, thank you. Um, and then also, I just wanna say again, that integrated plan actually answered a lot of some of the things that came to mind and that SAMR is you use the acronym sort of SAMR. Um, and what stood out is what you had in the introduction is simply supplying the devices um, is not enough to increase student achievement. It yeah. really is taking it to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was really the key point for me. And just the last one then, the digital tool review process, which I believe the, the council or the advisory council is working on mm -hmm. that they'll continue to do. As more tools are brought in, are some also um, uh, removed if they're just to, to keep, keep it, it fresh, fresh. Yeah, Correct. and not just accumulate. Right. Okay. We, we don't want a proliferation of a lot of tools, so we're constantly assessing Over, what's the most yeah. effective and what's going to be the standard and what will you direct people to. And that might include professional development on how to use the tool that's district approved, something mm -hmm. they might not know exists. Yeah. Okay. Right. So okay. that's in a constant updating. Perfect. Thank you. Mason. Director Herman asked one of my questions, so I don't have to thank you. I was wondering about um, if every student had device and connection. Um, I, I am curious a little bit about um, when you first initially developed this and it was rolled out into schools, there was some challenge because a lot of the uh, teacher preparatory courses don't go deep into teaching with technology. Are you seeing any changes there or are, are our newer teachers or coming to the district, are they such digital natives that um, it's sort of the way they think and what they do? I, I, where are we with that? Yeah, I, I, would say, I would say that they're a little more intuitive into being able to navigate uh, technology. Just it kind of comes a little more naturally to them. For example, I'm thinking of the panel training. We, we just had some for a new, new hire orientation during the board meeting. It's it's not difficult for them to pick up. It's the designing of the lessons using that technology that right. getting to that tier two to tier three. That's really where they that idea of using technology to design lessons and instruction that are engaging. That's the, the growth for them. I don't know that they spend as much time in that in their their preparatory courses because there's so many different digital tools each district offers. Right. So that's where we come in to help support that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good presentation. The only thing I'll say is, excuse me, is I'm very proud of what we've done as a district, you know, on the technology department. And, you know, my kindergartner comes home and he's it's like, I have a computer at school. I know how to do this now. <laughs> you know, it's very, I'm looking for, I'm counting the days until he's my tech support and I don't have to worry about it. It happens quick. Right. I can tell you. Um, That's on the roof. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm just, I'm, I'm always, um, Glad to see that we're moving forward and that we're constantly assessing things. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Student member, do you have any questions? Um, I don't really have a question, just more of a comment. Um, it's just been really cool to see like the work being done and having the things like implemented in our actual schools and like seeing the boards. A lot of my teachers have really liked working on the boards. Like my civics teacher today, she said that she felt like she was on a game show <laughs> because the board was like right behind her. So they've all really liked it and they've been help asking like students for help on 
how they <laughs> yes, even use the board. I've noticed that, <laughs> yes. We seem to understand it better. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's been really cool to have them in classes and like see the work that's been like talked about actually be out there. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gilbertson, do you have any questions? When you started talking about tier two and tier three with, with our staff and, mm -hmm. and how comfortable they are at integrating the technology within their lesson plan, or is that something that we're going to have every summer or throughout the, throughout the year when needed so that we can ensure that all of our teachers are comfortable with technology? It, it's really throughout the year. It's really every day, but it's throughout the year because we can't rely on a summer academy to get them boosted up. So it's it's really on demand. Part of that, uh, for example, we just uh, worked with our principals about designing tier two and tier three for their staff. So if you're a principal in your building, it's what are the needs of your building and then we design the PD around that and it's it's now. It's not, we're not waiting for distinct times to be able to provide that. Do we have tech support within the school themselves so that if a teacher or it's needed right then and there. How do I, you know, uh, incorporate something that's brand new that I haven't used before with the technology? Can they contact somebody within their schools right now? They could, it depends on what level of technology support they need, but yes, there is, if it's like, I need this thing to work and it's not working now, mm -hmm. um, that is available to them in real time. Uh, and if they're not somebody at elementary, they, they share support people. Okay. So there might be one person between two elementaries. Two elementaries. So if they're at one elementary, they run over to the other elementary. The, the learning and the training are that our facilitators and their LMS team does, um, that is based on their needs. They, they coordinate a time for them to be there so they can work alongside them um, to be able to design that in a, in a quicker way. And so the way they request that is through our online system to be able to, or they reach out and they, they email us about setting something up. Mm -hmm. So the, there's two different types of support we can provide our staff. Mm -hmm. And within the last levy that was passed, and I do want to say thank you very much, community, for supporting schools. Yes. Will that help us strengthen the wireless connections that, you know, we know we will need for the future? That's in the plan is to, it was in the last plan to build it up. We just completed that. Well, it's in the, the new plan. We're going to constantly have to be strengthening Wi-Fi <laughs> because that, that's just going to con continue to be a demand. Thank you very so, much. So yeah, that's in the plan. And are we doing anything to, to teach our kids about fishing and, and that type of things that will impact them, not only here at school, but maybe when they go home? Yes, and that's and in, their parents in the Digital Citizenship Unit is, is units on, uh, on fishing. And unfortunately, sometimes they, they learn by mistake and we, we help with the follow-up training to that. Uh, we all make mistakes, adults do as well, but there is proactive in the, the, the citizenship units, the safe practices unit is part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for I your really time. Are there any further questions? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Beckley. Thank you. We'll now move to section 13.0, which is unfinished business. There is no unfinished business scheduled to come before this meeting. We'll now move to section 14.0, which is our new business section. And we have a presentation on the approval of legislative priority. Our presenter is Mr. Mike Gunn. Uh, he will present the presentation and then we will have a discussion by our directors. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so each year our, uh, the Board of Directors approves the, um, a set of legislative priorities primarily for use during the upcoming legislative session. Uh, directors and district staff will then use those priorities to help provide a focus on the issues most pertinent to our school district um, that need legislative support and advocacy. 
The 2023 legislative session will run for 105 days, like it does every odd year. So it will begin on January 9th and end on April 24th this year. Um, <clears throat> the attachment to board docs prepares for your consideration and discussion um, and hopefully approval <coughs> tonight, the three highest priorities of the district for the legislative session. Uh, these priorities were selected from an extensive list of legislative priorities identified and evaluated by a variety of statewide school support groups. Um, so I'll go over those uh, fairly briefly and then let you have discussions and uh, consideration. The first one is to provide consistent, equitable, and ample uh, resources for education. Uh, fully fund basic education and increase the unrealistic staffing ratios contained in the prototypical school funding model. Uh, the two primary points under this would be to cover sh funding shortfalls in special education, transportation, and rising inflationary costs uh, for materials, supplies, and operating expenses. And then also funding for programs such as early childhood education, extended day and summer school. So that's the first bullet. That one really you can think of as educational resources. The second highest um, priority that we are proposing is to fully fund special education. Um, this honors the OSPI's uh, request to the legislature for a uh, budget request to, full, to fund the full cost of special education as a fundamental component of basic education. Um, districts like us continue to serve every student regardless of cost, and districts like us continue to rely on major investments of local levy dollars to provide these services. So that's the uh, second major priority. The third major priority, think of it as uh, advancing equity in public education. So this uh, is to request funding to allow us to provide each student with the resources they need to be successful. And um, some of these are services and programs that we already provide from local funding. We're asking the state to fully fund these things. Um, the first one is free meals for all students. Um, also included is training for all staff in diversity, equity, inclusion, and social emotional issues, not just our instructional staff, but all staff. Resources for continued remote learning connectivity that you just had a discussion about. So we're asking the state to provide the funding for that. And then, um, and also choice programs. And then finally, to uh, we're asking the state to provide resources, funding to pay for student fees such as dual credit programs, uh, the PSAT and the SAT, um, advanced placement testing and credits for college and the high school. So the third major priority has to do with advancing equity in public education. So with that, I will um, ask the um, uh, president, uh, Lisane, and board members to have discussions around these topics. There are about 20 minutes set aside for the discussion in this area. And I'd like, um, as our legislative representative, um, Director Nichols, to uh, provide an overview and then allow each one of us at least five minutes to ask or provide comments or questions about it, the direction, but I'd like him to lead the discussion. Um, I don't know that there's you know any other overview to be had um, than what was just given. I think it's important to note that um, that while generally traditionally we, we focus on the state legislature because that's the easiest for us to advocate to really these are our federal issues as well um you know these are things that we should be talking to our senators house of representatives about as well because part of our funding does come from there um and we can't rely on the state or our local communities for everything we need i, I can't think of a district in the nation that doesn't have problems funding special education problems with equity pop, problems with resources in general um, that that wouldn't benefit by this type of ad, advocacy. Um, 
I think there's a lot packed in here. Um, and then going forward, any sort of advocacy that we do do th with this, I think we'll, we'll find the most um, the most traction if we're focused targeting specific bills that are before the legislature, not just saying, hey, we want to fully fund special education, but like, you know, making sure that we're tracking those bills and things like that. So that'll be a big um, thing. So I'll open it up to uh, any concerns, questions, changes. Let's limit our first conversation round to five minutes and then then we'll proceed to the next person if we if that's necessary. We don't know. So I'll, right um, thank you again for voting at the at the WASA General Assembly and um, uh, I was very happy to see that the special education was on there as its own its own topic and appreciated the additional document that was included in there from OSPI. Um, what caught my attention was um, a few of those points that over half of Washington school districts exceed that um, funding cap of, of 13.5%. I had not realized that before that it was it was so many. Um, and then we in Everett are very much like across the state that the actual cost of delivery is that we provide about 18% over what actually gets funded. Um, and a little disappointed, honestly, in Washington that we have for special ed for the inclusion rates have been, um, they mentioned in 2019, bottom 10. In the last few years, we're we're still in the bottom half, so we have we have a lot of a lot of work to do as a state, but just happy to see that in there. And I would I would love if if and I'm guessing you as our rep will be tracking those bills. Is that something I'll I'll be? <coughs> yeah, we'll be happy we'll be, to with us and, and Wazda. We'll be perfect. Keeping an eye on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I think this is terrific, though. Thank you, Mr. Mason. <coughs> Yeah, I um, when I first read over this, I I think one of my concerns is um, we break it down into three big rocks, but then we pack everything else in the, the language below it, and um, there's so much that we could ask um, both at a state and a federal level to fund, um, and I feel like I guess it's me, but I'm. Um, really sticking to three big rocks rather than here's our rock but you know this 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 and this um so i i just have some concerns because i know that um you know districts come to the legislator and every year it's like you need to give us money for this you need to give us money for this and um and the list is long and it is but at some point we need to help them prioritize and I just have some concerns in this that we're not doing that when we add every single thing in that we would love to see funded. So I'll start there. And then um, my, my, my only other question concern is around advanced equity in public education and whether everything listed there is truly what's advancing would help advance equity. So for example, the SAT, which we offer to every junior during the school day, free of charge. Um, you know, in, in talking to folks in the district, there are a lot of people not taking that, that they just opt out. And, and then turns out, you know, none of our state universities and colleges require the SAT anymore. And so is that really advancing equity? <laughs> it's, just, it's just a question. Um, and then things like um, paying for AP classes. Um, I th I, I'm curious, and I don't know, whether students taking the AP test, who, takes, who doesn't take it because they can't afford it, I guess is maybe my question around some of those equity things, you know, the dual credit. I mean, obviously, I think that's a really important one. So I'm just kind of looking at all of these thinking, you know, in choice programs, the question there is, what is the funding we're asking for? Is that capital for you know redoing the building at Everett High so that we can complete that, or is it um, program money so that we can um, you know? To me, just choice programs doesn't say a whole lot if I were a legislator. So I am just asking my colleagues to reconsider. You know, do we need a laundry list? 
or if we we want to mention a few things, what are the two or three most important that truly would advance equity in our district? I think um, I think the language could definitely be tightened up. Um, and, and again, I'll say for the record that the fact that we have students paying for AP tests or um, <laughs> or summer school or anything to me is just insane. I mean, I grew up in a little tiny poor town in, on the border in Arizona, and I took AP classes, and I never paid for those tests. It was all provided by the district. I never paid for summer school when I needed to go. Um, it, it's just it's mind-boggling to me. Um, I, I also think that in addition to maybe tightening up some of this language, we also need to understand that as, as we advocate um, really what we're asking for, we need to show, be able to show um, the legislators numbers. Like if you give us funding for this, we'll be able to take our reading scores from X to Z. You know, if we get fundings for this, then we can provide this many more services or create this many more jobs. Like those, those numbers really, just like a job interview or anything else that you do in your life, like those numbers really help kind of show them. Cause it's, it's easy to go to somebody with your handout. It's hard, it's harder to communicate to them what the results of that funding is going to be um, or what we'll lose by not having that funding. Um, so those are the, those tactically, those are some things that, that we need to consider and then make sure we're getting data behind. Um, and I also think, you know, like I go back and forth on this. I don't know if I'm completely out of bounds, but to me, when I, when I see fully fund special education, I feel like we need to start talking about special education as basic education. Like it should be resources. Like if every student in our district needed special education services, it should already be packaged in. So changing the language and the way we think and talk about these things, I think is also important. Like, you know, we want to fund basic education, including special education services, uh, because they are part of basic education. I would agree with you on um, special education being basic education for a lot of students. But in the current situation which we are in, I look at it as they look at basic education as a separate and special education as it's separate funded differently. Yeah, they're funded, funded, funded right. differently. Yeah. 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 I am very so, glad that we are really sticking to fully fund special education because as Director Herman mentioned, the numbers are so skewed <laughs> as to how it's funded. And we need to ensure that all kids, if we want to be so focused on equity within public education, public education, private education is different, but we get all kids. We get kids who need special education or that extra focus around special education where some private schools don't get that. Uh, I agree with you that um, equity does include summer school because it's very important. I grew up where summer school was free. You didn't pay for it. You'd, AP testing, if you want to take the AP test, after you took the class, it was free. And so it wasn't, wasn't something that, because in my neighborhood, kids couldn't afford those things. And so that is also part of, I think, equity element. Uh, the PSAT and SATs, it may be true that some state schools do not require it. None of them do. But in certain <laughs> other states that kids may want to go to, it may still be a requirement. But we could offer it also free of charge for those who wanted to take it. Exactly. Of, because but that's I, part of an equity yeah. thing. If they yeah. say, look, I would like to take it because I'm going to apply to these schools and it costs and I can't afford it. We pay for it. That's wonderful. That's part of the equity to ensure that they have successful venture into whatever college. I think that's a great thing to continue to offer. The choice programs, I think we should spell it out because right now there are a lot of parents that are saying, let's get some vocational uh, classes back into the schools so that our kids won't go to college. Well, if they're doing advanced manufacturing or sometimes even computer uh, information technology, you may not need to go to college after the certificates that are given out at those particular choice programs. 
So we need to spell those out. And we should also mention, and I think it's a good idea, last year we saw uh, 25 kids that went through these courses and each one um, got a job right out of, out of high school uh, making $50,000, $60,000 or whatever. That shows that it was beneficial. Ask a clarifying question of Mr. Gunn. Two, actually. <laughs> When we say choice programs here, what are we asking funding for specifically? And I am not clear on that myself. Okay. And then my other question is um, dual credit programs. What are the fees for dual credit programs? Because we mentioned college and the high school. Yeah. I think and Dr. Willard, can you answer, or somebody else who can answer that? I, well, Dr. Willard is coming up. I did want to make one comment, though, and that is that um, a lot of the uh, fees that, that we've mentioned in the advanced equity uh, priority, we do as a district pay for already. Right. And I think yes. what we're actually Correct. asking is that the, the state, state take pick on it up. that obligation. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. So for dual credit, there are three different kinds of credit that we're talking about. Advanced placement courses, generally those are $97 per exam. Um, the AP research and seminar are slightly more expensive. We do have waivers for students who meet free and reduced uh, lunch and we're able to claim so that they don't, they don't pay anything. Uh, we also have some small amounts that pay for some students um, based on need or extreme circumstances. So we work with the foundation and others to help, but it's very little. Uh, we also have college in the high school, which is pretty extensive. Uh, for a five credit college class, that's going to be $220. And right now we're very fortunate because in addition to um, in addition to having the foundation pay for some of them and having some waivers for free and reduced lunch, we actually received a grant through the Washington Student Achievement Council, and we have upwards of $108,000 for Everett High and Cascade High School for students to qualify for those funds. And that's largely around free and reduced lunch. Our gear up program at Everett High School pays for students regardless of free and reduced lunch, so that pays for some of them. But we do have gaps for students who don't show up in those pockets or at Jackson High School in particular around college and the high school. And UW in the high school is going to be much more expensive um, at $440, I believe, per five credit class. In addition, we have CTE dual credit, which actually is of no cost to students, but that's because our district pays the fee, which is $50 per student per class. And that um, also allows students to earn college credit as well. But if our district did not pay for that, what we're asking for is the state to pay for that's that. That's right. There are gaps in every single one of those areas. Okay. Yeah. And the gaps and pay for the gaps. Yes. Correct. So it is a little repetitive. Yeah. Well, and, and I think. Um, if we really wanted to tighten this language up a bit, uh, it, it's it's we're we're telling a story, right? So, like in business, you you have a brand story. You have this. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we stand for, right? Um, and this is the hero's journey that we're on. Mm -hmm. So, here's the hero's journey that our our kids are on. Is you know, Esser funding provided all of these resources and allowed us to do so many amazing things. And now it's going away and we desperately want to keep those benefits going. This is what additional funding would do for us. This is what's going to happen if we don't fund these things. Um, and so instead of a laundry list of these are all the things just kind of painting the picture very simply. Um, this is what we're after. This is what we're about. Okay, we can wordsmith this yeah. and we can make it fit what we're actually asking for. We don't have to wait. How would you do that, directors? I try and stay away from wordsmithing on the dais, <laughs> personally. <laughs> we could be here all night. <laughs> actually, can I ask this um, one page document? How is this then communicated? Uh, because I, I like what you said about if we can if we can match if this is sort of a green light that these are the things that we are going to be advocating for, then from there on, uh, when those bills are, those opportunities are present, then we can we can get more 
detailed um, with however it is affected. Um, I guess I see this one pager as sort of our, um, our, our, our stamp of approval of a general direction, but I, maybe you could clarify that. Yeah, I think traditionally this is something, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is something that we've obviously posted on our website that we, we talk about, and then it's kind of a, uh, I don't know if we've ever actually provided this to legislators, have we? We have. Uh, and it's, it's really kind of guiding those talking points when you do. Um, but if we are distributing this to legislatures, which I think is a great idea, I mean, mass mailer, just do it, you know, it's one page. Um, but usually, it, telling a story on it is really going to be, it's got to get somebody's attention. And the, the way in which we can tell the story, when we uh, do our legislative visit, I guess you would say, in January, usually with our students, uh, we tell the story. This becomes the uh, outline of how we address the need. And we we use that opportunity to talk to each one of our legislature. So I would push back on that in the sense, in, in the sense that those legislators are having what, like 20 meetings a day with different interest groups. They're not going to remember next, or they're going to remember next to nothing that was told to them. What they are going to remember is the document we leave with them or we leave with their, uh, you know, assistant, whoever it is. That, that way they, when they come across it and they go, oh yeah, okay, yeah, these bills are coming up and this is what, I can take this to the floor and I can say, this is what this means. This is why we have to pass this one piece of legislation. Um, and then it might prompt them to reach back us to get specific examples, things like that. So um, I really, I think talking with them is great. Um, and it, it does things, but they're burnt out by the end of the day. They don't have, they don't have the capacity for that, just like we would be um, so we also have the opportunity when legislatures when they come and visit us mm -hmm. when they sit down and we have one on one with them here at the district and we talk to them so they have that time as well and we can invite them to come and talk with us and they usually come yeah i'd like i'd love to see getting them to schools more i think that's much more impactful they can go see our choice programs or play and learn or some of the things that we're asking um, funding for. Right. If they can witness it right. in person, I think that's right. much more powerful than sitting around a table and talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, honestly, what's easier? Train five plus people on how to do these talking points or <laughs> have a document that is very passionate and simple and that they can have and keep, you know, I, I think right. it's an economy of time issue. So maybe one way to approach it as I look at like the last paragraph is, you know, what are, what, what do you folks believe are the three most important things that would advance equity in our district? And is there a way to sort of simplify that language rather than, you know, every fee that we assess on a student, <laughs> Um, is there a way that we can say that, you know, in a, in a more generalized way? I would look at also choice programs and expanding them and actually being succinct and saying what they are and the cost associated with that and the outcome as to. I think we need to speak to that point, though, because it's going to get really long if we yeah. start. <laughs> yeah, I adding mean, that in. This should be really a really basic narrative. Okay. Um, and I think I, I, you know we can get into the weeds, but like I would definitely love to take a crack at at writing something uh, for this that tells that story. But I don't have the data that I need to tell that story, so I, I'd have to rely on cabinet to be able to look at the data and say, okay, these are kind of the, the highlights. Um, and then we can, and I also trust that we have enough creative writers in cabinet that they could probably do that. Too. If you give cabinet time and let us know, we can get it to you. Yeah. The cabinet could assist you. Okay. So Mr. Gunn, do you have enough input from us, from our discussion as to how we can put a little bit 
more into this. The, the, the big rocks, the big rocks remain still the same as listed. Those are the big rocks. And it's really the narrative under the big rocks. Too many pebbles underneath. The pebbles <laughs> underneath the big rocks that we need to yes. tweak. And Thank who, you. And who ha whoever is, is working on the language for this, and you want to, if you want to shoot me an email, um, and we can kind of go through <clears throat> I'm happy to work with you folks and the same thing if the board members have specific ideas let me know and we'll get it done I'll have staff get to you on Monday staff if you can work now we get to Andrew Nichols by Monday fantastic do we have enough yep okay appreciate thank you very thank much thank you Mr. very Gunn. much thank you we'll now move to section 15.0, which is upcoming agenda items. Dr. Faulkner, what's planned for our next upcoming agenda? Well, thank you, Madam Chair and, and, and Board and Public. It's nice to hear about the big rocks. Models are instructional review, so I do appreciate that language. Um, and it sounds like you're off to a great start uh, with these legislative needs. Thank you. At the November 15th special meeting, the Board will conduct the superintendent's evaluation. At the uh, November 17th special meeting, the board will participate in the WASDA annual conference. At the December 13th meeting, the board will have this recon board recognition reorganization, sorry, board reorganization. Fourth quarter financial report, our fiscal outlook, our August, September, and October financial reports, surplus technology equipment and vehicles, ASB constitutions, and special education extended learning contracts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. We'll now move to section 16.0. Um, 16.01 is, is uh, the executive closed session. Tonight, the board will hold an executive session to hear from an update from legal counsel about a potential litigation involving the district. At this time, the regular meeting is recessed for approximately three minutes to be reconvened in an executive session in the Silver Lake room for approximately 20 minutes. No action, no action will be taken during the executive session. After the executions, the accession I will come back and reconvene the regular meeting and take us to adjournment. Thank you.